Here's a man. That's the kill bit at parties for old people. And his TCP sessions are always responded to with an ack! <laughs> Paul Asadorian! Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Paul.com Security Weekly. This is episode 341. It's August 15th. And I'm um, very excited to be here with uh, almost... Is that what that smell is? Yeah, it is. It's so exciting. We can. You may even be able to smell it when you're listening to this driving in your car. Ooh. Mr. Larry Pesci is here to my Yay. left. Uh, and Allison Nixon's here in the studio. Welcome, Allison. Hi. Yes, welcome back after a, a brief uh, sabbatical. <laughs> I've been so crazy busy. And, and, now and then I'm you still, were sick. Yeah, I'm still a little con bit flu. sick. Con SARS. Jack is always sick, and he's here in the studio as well. But that's just his mind. What? Welcome. Where? What? What? What's up? Is it, are I, you having a senior I, moment? Why am I here? What? Is every <laughs> moment senior after a certain point, Jack? Is that how it works? On the lines via Skype, Carlos Perez. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Sounding better than ever after a new sound rig. Sound fantastic, <laughs> Carlos. Thanks. Awesome. Expert Steve is actually here after spending ungodly amounts of time at, at DEF CON and Black Hat and trapped in my car and trapped in the trunk of Jack Daniel's car on the way Whoa, to in the trunk. trunk man you were riding in style a double cross country journey for Jack and Steve and uh, they look different they look different well Steve got a haircut and I think uh, Jack's beard is even grayer than it was when he left. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> just a couple of quick announcements to get us started uh, John Strain and I recently, along with some other co-authors, released a book on offensive countermeasures. You can visit tinyurl.com forward slash OCM dash Amazon to add this to your summer reading list. And the summer is almost nearing to a close, so make sure you go ahead and read it. The feedback has been fantastic so far. We did a book signing when we were uh, at Black Hat. We sold books when we were at DEF CON. Um, and uh, they're selling like hotcakes. So go get your copy today and learn all about offensive countermeasures, the art of active defense. And I love your comment that uh, you guys will sign them uh, at when the opportunity arises and actually lowers the value. It does devalue. Yes, after we awesome. sign it, we give you a discount if you're purchasing at the same time of signing. Uh, come to a, a special webcast on Thursday, August 22nd with Symantec titled Fighting Malware, Taking the Endpoint Back. We're looking for sponsors for September uh, webcast as well as uh, November and December and pretty much all into the future. Please contact Paul at hacknaked.tv for more details on webcast sponsorship. Don't forget, right after this show, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time is the Stogie Geek Show featuring myself, usually Stogie Santa, Mark Jr., and our special guest that's been on here is uh, called uh, Cigar Coop. He actually runs oh. a very popular blog. He'll be joining us as well. Nice. Uh, so 9 p.m., come have a cigar with us, and don't forget to go to the show notes, print off your $5 off coupon for the Havana Cigar Club, which is right down the street from the studios, and uh, that's good for your first-time visit. On to the feature interview for this show. Whit Diffie, Dr. Whit Diffie, is a pioneer of public key cryptography and was the VP of Information Security in Cryptography at ICANN. He's also the author of Privacy on the Line, The Politics of Wiretapping and Encryption. How Welcome, Whit, to the show. Thank you. So, Whit, how did you get your start? In so why do I hear a ghostly voice talking against you? Um, it's g Gremlins. <laughs> Probably. I mean, it sounds like the uh, the host of a uh, horror movie show. Really? That's interesting. Maybe it's uh, the voices in my head leaking through into okay. my microphone. No, no. It had something to do... I When I said earlier I'd put my hand over my microphone, I pressed it, and in fact it clicked. Ah, okay. And that changed something. I don't know what there is here to change, but all right. Now everything's fine. Good, good. Except so that I... You missed the question. I want a copy of your uh, your book for my fee. We will offensive countermeasures, and I'll give you I'll give you a sound bite in return. Okay. This should be called pretaliation. Oh. <laughs> I'm pretaliate against I like these that. people. Brilliant. We will send you a copy of our book. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, do you want the uh, lower value Is signed the copy? Signed copy or the unsigned? <laughs> I'll, have lower, I'll have a lower value signed copy okay. and a supplementary PDF. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> one, from a, one to put on my bookshelf to look good and one to read. There you go. Nice. Uh, so how did you get your start in information security? Uh, the 
the key point was that in about this time in 1972, uh, Larry Roberts, who was funding the ARPANET, went to see um, Howard Rosenblum, who was deputy director for information security or communication security at NSA, and said, you know, we have this $100 million a year military communications research activity. We should think we should think about security. And I assume they agreed on that, but they couldn't agree on anything else because Roberts didn't want to support any secret work and Rosenblum didn't want to do anything else. So Roberts goes back to his office in Roslyn. He has a job where his PIs come by with their hats in their hands and they have to listen to whatever he else, you know, whatever he wants to talk about. So that week he talked about network security and my boss John McCarthy came came by and got an earful and came home and gave us an earful back home. I got started up on the subject and uh, still, still, still working on it. Uh, what forty years later? Mm. So, w- what advice do you have? The other for- thing you should have to is to have to have the waiter bring me a drink, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll find, have to find a local courier service to bring our guests drinks. That's a fantastic suggestion. I see. Like- that looks to me like a champagne glass. I'm. But no. I'll, I'll think about get, getting a nice beer. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Um, so it, we, we need like an Uber for beverages. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So Ooh, for people beer. just getting started out in the field, with, what advice do you have for them uh, to get started in this field of security? We'll work in some broader field like bioengineering. So I mean, it's pretty serious. I think I think security. I, you know, in parallel with what somebody used to say on the Tonight Show, baseball have been a very good to me. I've done pretty well off security, but it's not the be all and end all of the world. Mm. And if you're starting a career, I would think about starting a career in something really fundamental. You know, gene line engineering, linguistics, I don't know. But uh, if you insist on uh, going into security, well, the thing, you know, biting me these last few years is that for roughly the last 40 years, we've been working on what's called the confinement problem, executing software without allowing it to harm you, mm. and that problem is still unsolved. Oh. No, yeah, that's an excellent point. Absolutely. Um, so what led you to start working on a new cryptographic algorithm that led to public key cryptography? Uh, see the answer to question one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my, my other question is, you know, we all know the, the Diffie-Hellman al- algorithm. So explain how the, the Hellman okay. part got on there. Okay. How's that? So um, let me start by summarizing. There actually are another two sources of this activity. Um, in... Uh, 1965, I was talking to a friend who uh, who was doing a lot of work with NSA, and I began to wonder how they secured the telephones in their own building. The answer, incidentally, is that they run them in shielded conduit. But mm-hmm. I uh, couldn't. I, I assumed you'd want to encrypt them, and what I couldn't see was how to encrypt them in such a way that every, you know, that that every any of every individual phone call was secured against everybody else in the world. And so I didn't see how to solve that, and I put it in the back of my mind because I wasn't working on cryptography. And then in 19, late 1969, I came here to Stanford. I was working for the aforementioned John McCarthy. But he was, when I arrived, he was off in Bordeaux giving a paper on what we would now call Internet commerce. So he came back and he was talking about this stuff and I got to thinking about what you would do for signatures in a paperless office. And I didn't know how to do that either. And, you know, the the problem being that we depend on uniqueness of signatures, but digital things can always be copied perfectly. And so in the spring of 1975, after I had been working on cryptography, uh, in two events within a few days of each other, I suddenly realized that I there was that one thing would solve both of these problems that I had been thinking about on the back back of my mind, one for ten years and one for five, and the result was what uh, what's called public key cryptography. Um, how Hellman came into it uh, is that I at one point I went to visit Alan Tritter at uh, IBM Yorktown Heights 
I was introduced to him uh, by the son of my uh, mentor and boss the, uh, at the first job I'd held. And Tritter, who I don't know if you still know him, he was a great phone freak in the early days, and he called himself the biggest man in computer science. That is, he weighed 500 pounds. <laughs> Bigger than Joel Moses by, say, 50%. And uh, he introduced me to his boss, was Alan Conheim. And Alan Conheim was very secretive. He wouldn't tell me anything. He only told me one thing, and then he later, he, now he's wished he'd never said that. Uh, Conheim said, you know, we can't can tell you anything about what we're doing here. But my old friend Marty Hellman was around here a few months ago, and I couldn't tell him anything either. But you should go look him up when you get back to the West Coast, because two people can work on a problem better than one. And um, the uh, I came back out here. I called Hellman. He graciously granted me half an hour of his time between 4.30 and 5. I... Uh, my wife and I drove down, and uh, she dropped me off. She went off and did something, and she called back in around 5.30, and we were still talking, and he invited us to dinner at his place, and we were still, you know, we finally left around 11, and uh, the two of us then worked together for uh, four years uh, and uh, became a great pain in Alan Conheim's ample tush. Mm -hmm. uh, because we object, his, his, his group is one of the key groups in the uh, data encryption standard, and we started to fuss about whether the data encryption standard was strong enough. Um, so that's how I got involved with Hellman. Excellent. Um, so was there a debate as to whose name would go first? Or I think mine went first because it was alphabetically yeah, first. Alphabetically, I was going to say. Okay. That would have been my guess. Um, so the important point is, I mean, the the Diffie-Hellman algorithm is only, you know, it's one of several algorithms in public key cryptography. What I I, I would, you know, I'm not going to take credit. I'd take more credit for the uh, for the notion of asymmetry in cryptography and the fact that you could have components, keys, and components of keys that you made public, while there were others that you kept secret. Mm. What what is your kind of opinion as to what's happened since then? And you know, we've covered security news for the past eight years. We've talked a lot about there's this flaw in SSL, or there's this great implementation of the key exchange. Kind of what's your you know kind of summary of what's happened over the last several years with cryptography, and well, particularly the, the element. at the level of cryptograph cryptographic algorithms, we think we're doing very well. Um, from there, it goes straight downhill. Crypto implementation isn't, mm. you know, usually isn't very good. Operating systems are dreadful. Application security is dreadful. Protocol security isn't so good. So the, it's amazing that cryptography is as so, is vital as it is as a field. I mean, there's a meeting next uh, week in Santa Barbara that will have hundreds of people at it, and they aren't all old farts like me. There are people, you know, occasionally we get high school students, have a significant number of undergraduates and lots of graduate students. And I think that's because of the intrinsic intellectual interest of the field. Mm. But um, as a practical matter, it's perfectly plausible uh, that we have – We've solved that piece of the problem. It's certainly the best cooked part of information security, but everything else about the field is dreadful. Do you ever get people that come up to you and say, "Hey, you know, I, I read the the algorithm and I, you know, I understand it, and I think I can make it better, or I think I can come up with my own"? Well, probably, and you know, surely a number of people have. I mean, if you're looking for a forefront. The brief history of this informa of the these number theoretic things is that Diffie Hellman works over quite a variety of of of, of, of arithmetic structures. Um, RSA only works in the one case, only works in arithmetic modular in modular integers. Um, but the big discovery in the you know mid late eighties was that you can make uh, Diffie Hellman and the related. Uh, El Gamal signature algorithm work over uh, what are called elliptic curve groups 
And so you can make all the numbers much smaller. You can get them down from thousands of bits to hundreds of bits, which is very convenient. So, I mean, a lot of people, you know, we didn't say the last word in this field. Mm -hmm. And the one of the big open issues now, and in respect in which cryptography is not a closed, no, by no means a solved problem, is that the most conspicuous threat uh, is what's called quantum computing, which it, which finds finds cycles in in uh, in these structures very well, and all the uh, kind of the public key systems I was involved with involve hidden cycle links and what's called Shor's algorithm finds them very quickly. So if the physicists deliver on quantum computing, it will, it will badly damage all of the current uh, public key systems. Mm -hmm. And so people are returning to looking at coding theory based or knapsack based various, various other kinds of, uh, of approaches. Now, couldn't you also use quantum computing to uh, implement better cryptographic algorithms? Well, maybe you could, but at the very least, there's going to be a window of vulnerability there because for some period of time, quantum computers presumably will be things that, you know, may be large. They have to be run in supercooled refrigerators. I don't know exactly. I mean, those are – that latter way in particular is characteristic of some of these things. And so uh, the distance between that and something, you know, SSL is the most widely deployed – piece of crypto security uh, ever, right? There are billions of them probably. And it'll be a long time before you can use quantum computing in your laptop. So in between, there'll be a period when you're using our current computing to do your encryption and somebody may be using quantum computing to attack it. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, did you ever think about the uses for the algorithms that you created and how bad people might use the algorithms and kind of toil with that situation or you know are bad people going to do bad things and that's you know going to happen regardless? I've never lost any sleep over that. <laughs> uh, one, I mean, I don't think uh, the uh, I don't see any great reason. To you know, assume that the course of cryptography, uh, it might have been, it might have taken a while or something like that. It might have looked a bit different, but it's clear that there are plenty of smart people working in cryptography, and so I think all stripes of people, whether you like their politics or not, mm -hmm. um, are going to uh, going to be able to make use of these techniques. Now, as to whether, you know, did I think about what it would be used for? Yeah, my fantasy in the mid-70s was securing all the telephones in North America. Mm -hmm. right, so that's why that's in some sense now, what led to public key. Yeah. If you want to have 100 million secure telephones in the country, you can't, um, you can't, do, you can't do it so readily by the uh, conventional techniques. Now, when you say securing the telephones, is that, uh, do you mean preventing... I meant encrypting all the speech. Okay, so preventing eavesdropping. Right. And that preventing it from each other? Preventing it from our own government? Well, foreign preventing it, hopefully, I, 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 had, I was very ambitious. I had this notion that a, a phone call should not be understandable by any other, anyone other than the people talking on it. Right. Period. Mm -hmm. And that's, that came true today, right? Sorry? <laughs> Is that, that's true today, correct? <laughs> well, I mean, I think you can do it, but nobody's yeah. succeeded in doing it on any, any large scale. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, the government had a network with half a million secure phones. I don't know what the number is right mm -hmm. now. People like Quiet Circle have very nice security products, but I don't know how many subscribers they have. Mm hmm Interesting. So, um, when we start talking about uh, privacy, you've uh, authored a book, Privacy on the Line. Uh, the politics of wiretapping and encryption. How timely! Now, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't not ask you about current events, right? Being the author uh, you know, of this book, and so, what is your take on the current events and the recent happenings with the NSA, um, the Edward Snowden leak, and uh, this basic notion of really somewhat compelling evidence that uh, our own government is spying on us? Oh. Um, well, I hadn't doubted that for a very long time, though mm. uh, Though the information that's come out makes it all a lot more concrete and visceral. 
And it seems, you know, my major, I haven't, I haven't published anything yet on this, my major uh, policy response has been to think that, you know, the, the clear failure is on the part of Congress to assert its, uh, assert its, uh, its role, to do its job. And the key thing is that the, the executive branch has gotten away with making it very difficult for Congress and these tricks, you know, saying they'll tell senators things, but they won't let them take notes, they won't let them talk to their staffs, etc. And they claim that there's an executive privilege. It seems to me what's much clearer than that in the Constitution is, um, is the power of the purse on the part of Congress. So I think Congress, you know, it needs to, it needs to, maybe revamp its own clearance procedure. I understand it has one, but uh, it should assert that it is responsible for the clearances of members, the clearances of staff, and that any agency that wants to get funded is going to come down and explain to Congress on Congress's terms, leave any documents that Congress tells says it wants with them, and. Uh, that 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 the funding hearings will be the bottom line of uh, of the, of the functioning of the government. <clears throat> Has it gotten so large that even if we had uh, has what gotten so large? Uh, the government and government agencies and the number of contractors that government agencies uh, employ to do this kind of work that this conceivably is for good, right? They're trying to find intelligence that will help defend the nation. But it hasn't gotten so large that it's almost impossible to control. Uh, I read some statistic that there are more contractors that have uh, clearance levels than there are actual government employees, for example. Well, that might be true. I, I don't know. Um, that's all documented to death in a book called Top Secret America. Uh, but I don't know whether something gets too large. I mean, it's it's a large activity, but it's by no means the majority of the government, right? I don't think it's anything like as large as the military, let alone, uh, you know, other major government government activities. So uh, I don't know. I don't know how to count the size in this matter. Mm. I mean, I think do think what's sort of interesting, right, is that they they are worried about the discretion of Congress, which has five hundred and thirty five members, and I would. I don't know how many staff per member, possibly, you know, would it average 10? I don't know offhand, but say, you know, a total, a total of very small number of tens of thousands of people, I assume at most, uh, work for Congress. Uh, but whereas there seem to be, you know, uh, something like a million people, according to these books, with, uh, with special intelligence clearances. So the what's amazing is that it's taken so long you know they've really been amazingly good at uh, at persuading people to uh, keep their mouths shut. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, along those lines, do you think privacy is dead? I think I don't know what privacy is, and I don't know whether anybody else does. Mm. Um, I mean, I think the thing that's worrisome about the current world is not that people know things about you, but that people you have no way of knowing about know things about you. So people like to talk about, you know, there not being any privacy in small towns. But the critical thing about small towns is that you know much the same things about your neighbors they know about you, which makes them answerable uh, at, many, at many levels for what they do with the, the information. And this is true of all sorts of social groups. Whereas if you look at anything from, you know, NSA to Equifax to Choice Point, et cetera, all of these organizations have tremendous capacity to find out um, about you, and you have essentially no capacity to find out about them. Although I have to credit, my wife uh, said months ago, you know, I think this is going to turn out to cut both ways. And if we have no privacy, it's going to turn out they have no privacy. And I was skeptical and worried. And I said, you know, I think, I think organization, organizational security is getting more and more credit in society and this, that, and the other. And then Snowden came along. So <laughs> I, get to, I, I get to play the know-it-all, you know, husband with a come up in the role. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how does the, um, the the government in this case, you know, particularly the NSA, uh, do they have to work to build credibility back and gain to gain trust to move forward? 
um, you know, recently General Alexander gave a talk at the popular Black Hat conference. And when I read the and watched some of the videos and read the proceedings, it seemed like a lot in the security community, especially, had kind of lost faith uh, in in trust. Any trust they had for someone like the NSA, for example, is completely gone. Um, well, in the first the first election of trust is what you're trusting people to do. Now, disclosure: I'm I'm, in, I'm overall a fan of signals intelligence, mm-hmm. um, and. <clears throat> I don't know how to solve. So one of the big problems is that unlike cryptography, you cannot really do signals intelligence in public. If you rub people's nose in it that they are reading their traffic every time you do it, they'll do something about it and that make your job harder. Yep, yep. On the other – so you know, my proposal about Congress is I'm kind of inclined toward what a lot of people said, that it's – fine to have detail, secrecy about details, but that you really shouldn't have uh, secrecy about the whole you know, scope of the activity. Um, in particular, I mean, it seems to me one of the most worrying things that we've had is this you know, uh, Kafka-esque phenomenon that the real law is the secret executive branch interpretation of the law. And I think that extends much more widely than the intelligence stuff. So I've been bothered for a while. I mean, I knew about, you know, classified legal opinions uh, for quite some time. Well, so did lots of so did people in general. I mean, that was true, say, of the torture memos and things like that. But that uh, vast range of government operations are governed not by some law that you can read, but by some arcane legal interpretation of the law that you can't, uh, that seems very, very threatening to uh, to having any sort of democracy. Are there things that we can do in order to maintain our privacy, or is it a lost cause? Well, as I said, since I'm not sure what privacy is, mm. um, Loosely speaking, it has no chance against – human autonomy doesn't seem to have a lot of chance against increasing communications. So look at it at the high and the low. Right? At the time of the, the founding of the country, the president you know, gave orders to a, to a general, said go do this and heard the general's report months later about what had been done and, you know, the general got court-martialed or commended or something depending on whether, whether, what he'd do, whether the president liked what he'd done. Mm-hmm. Look forward to something like the attack on the liberty, right? The general belief there is that the commander of the Sixth Fleet tried to protect the liberty and was directly ordered by Washington to get his planes back, back on the carrier decks. Uh, so the autonomy of a of a general who's commanding, you know, one of half a dozen or dozen major U.S. fleets in the world, um, just directly gets called by his boss and told what to do sort of on a moment-to-moment basis. Look at another case much further down the stack. Twenty years ago, 25, a truck driver had a pretty autonomous job. Yes, you know, his boss says, pick up this load in Maine and get it to San Diego by the end of the week. And so the driver has, you know, five or six or seven days or something to drive across the country. Uh, as long as he gets there in time and doesn't use too much extra gas, his boss isn't really going to care what route he takes. Not going not to be too concerned, might care in principle, but doesn't going to try to do anything about it. If the driver picks up another load somewhere along the line and detours a little to to take that because he's got some empty space. Well, now they all are being tracked by GPS. And I don't know the details, but I wouldn't be surprised if the driver gets a call from his boss if he's an hour behind schedule or an hour ahead of schedule or 10 miles off the route. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's easy to imagine a world in which not only you have no privacy, but you have very little independence. Um, Now, you ask another question which is more a tactical question. It's not a question about, you know, decades, but about months or years. Can we do something to improve our privacy? And I assume the answer is yes. But so far, um, I don't think most of the attempts to do this have been very successful because all of the things, basically, to be a big enterprise, to affect a lot of people, something has to be a business success. And as far as I can tell, uh, 
business and privacy don't seem to be very compatible, that the what has proved to be the uh, the route to riches has been intruding on your customer's privacy, and people have been very successful at getting away with it. So the businesses who – people in business to protect privacy are so far niche businesses, you know, Wicker, Quiet Circle, uh, these two, the, this one that closed down its email, uh, Lava something Lava uh, recently, and – the giant companies have all, as far as I can see, pretty much lined up on the on the side of the view that they can do anything with it, with that if they can do anything with anything they learn about their customers that they like. Did you guys have other questions for uh, Wit, Carlos, Jack Allison, Larry? Negative. Steve. I'm, just, I'm still just in awe of the, yeah. of the man himself. Processing, processing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a lot to think about. Um, where, where does where is the hummingbird algorithm, and where would it be optimal? Well, um, the it's it's an algorithm designed to use minimal electrical power, because in a lot of things like, like smart cards or RFID, wireless sensor networks, uh, you don't. You have a very low power budget, and you can't, don't have a battery. Maybe you may be operating on radiated power. So that was the objective of that algorithm. Um, the company that um, the company that was uh, was pushing it uh, has closed down, been reincarnated, is not uh, n not looking terribly lively, and. As a result of a presentation we made at NSA two years ago, I think NSA liked the uh, liked the uh, the problem we presented, but didn't like the solution, and they went and designed a couple of uh, algorithms of their own mm -hmm. with a very similar criterion. They emphasized minimal gate count, which is not exactly the same as minimal power consumption, but they're closely related. And then they did a really strange thing. I had heard they were designing designing against this problem, and I figured they'd build something the military would use it or something like that. But no, what they did was they published it. That was nice. The other interesting thing was they didn't publish it on their own website. They published it on, quote, ours. That is to say, the website of the International Association for Cryptologic Research. Mm -hmm. So this is just two months ago in June, but as a matter of fact, it's uh, no, not quite two months ago. It's June 20th. This paper appeared with two algorithms called Simon and Spec. One more oriented toward hardware, the other one more oriented toward software. And uh, both, to my mind, very straightforward. Uh, Hummingbird is a really novel design. It's very interesting, but uh, that gives you marketing problems of explaining it to everybody, getting it evaluated, uh, etc. And uh, so, I think the uh, I think this may may portend uh, a very serious piece of competition. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, when it when it comes to Security in general, uh, you mentioned before that we have this problem with software security, right? And that really, uh, I think, is probably in my list of you know top five problems that we have now. We um, are looking at software security is is probably being in that list for sure. And how do you, do you think that someday we'll solve these problems? Do you think that you know we'll be looking back? On the problems we have today, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, going, wow, that was a real pain in the butt back then, but we've, we know we've solved that problem. Do you foresee us going there? Do you have, you know, some Well, I probably would have thought that 10, 20, or 30 years ago, so anything <laughs> I say, you know, is, uh, is kind of suspect. Um, let, me, uh, let me sort of pose this question back to you. Mm -hmm. um, would these problems have been solved if the big players really wanted them solved? Mm. So I ask myself, do the giant companies really want their users to be secure against them? So do they want you to have absolute configuration control over what runs on your computer? Uh, and there are a whole bunch of things that suggest to me that they don't. So I'm, I was told, I'm not a Microsoft user, so I don't know their stuff firsthand, but I was told that some versions of Windows contractually obliged you to accept updates. And that's because they uh, 
they uh, they they anticipated changes in digital rights management that weren't in your interest, and so you were being obliged to accept changes that made the software worse from your point of view. Mm. Um, the I am a little skeptical. You know, do you do you think that? Uh, Oh, and the other thing, something called the Trusted Computing Group was organized to put things called Trusted Platform Modules into yes. computers, and they are in a lot of them. And for something like the electric power grid, that's a great idea. The Trusted Platform Module controls the um, controls what the computer can say to other parts of the network about how it's configured. But in consumer electronics, this seems to me just a dreadful idea. And the original internet notion that you have um, standardized interfaces but proprietary implementations is exactly the right thing for progress, for individual autonomy, uh, everything else. And right now you already find, I mean, you know, my, my, my Wells Fargo won't accept my talking to it with anything other than, you know, the standard browsers, Safari, Chrome, I, Internet Explorer, maybe something else. But it doesn't, it doesn't like WGET. And in principle, one could, you know, send it the right signals and fool it. But the result is I can't write a program to process my, uh, my bank statement at all as readily as I would like. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they could force me to enforce my configuration with trusted platform module, then maybe they could uh, they would have something standing between me and doing that that's more than the fact that I have other other things that are more important to do than learn more about the uh, about about those protocols. Is is that what you mean in, in your talk a secure internet could not serve our needs? Is that kind of a No, I think what I mean in that is that classic secure networks were meant for friends to talk to each other. When you talk about Auditin or Cipernet or, you know, any of these government networks that have been secured, they means all in principle, everybody who has access to the network is somebody with some layer level of clearance and is, you know, a Yankee or from one of the five eyes countries or, or whatever the criteria are. The critical thing about the Internet is that it's meant for people who aren't friends to talk to each other. Mm. And in a vague sense, that was true of the telephone system, but the telephone system was so much human-mediated, it didn't have the same issues the Internet has. Hmm. So why is crime essential to the Internet? Well, I think it's just because, you know, I think crime is essential to, is essential to life. Um, my, uh, I, I look at something that's commonly called a crime, like, you know, you come home from dinner and somebody's kicked in your front door and stolen your TV. And, you know, the criminal goes off and sells the TV to a fence for 50 bucks and maybe the fence sells it to somebody else for 75 and that, that end of the trail kind of dies off. And you call the police and a couple of them are beginning, making, I don't know what police make, you know, 25 to 50 an hour or something. They come around they talk to you for half an hour and they make a report and then a couple a detective or two come around and they're making 50 to 75 an hour and they talk to you for half an hour and then, you know, the next day you call the locksmith and the locksmith comes over and pairs your door and that's a few hundred dollars and the insurance adjuster comes around and he talks to you for half an hour or an hour and uh, goes off and eventually insurance pays off and you buy a new TV and all together you know several thousand dollars worth of legitimate business that has grown out of this uh, out of this theft of your TV that made almost no money for the criminals so it's just my impression uh, I haven't done any serious sociological study. It's my impression that crime, the things that are called crime are a very big part of the economy. And if the Internet is to serve the economy, it's got to serve every aspect of the economy. I was always told growing up that crime doesn't pay, but you've changed my viewpoint on that. Well, wait a minute. I mean, a lot of things ought to have changed your viewpoint. Have you looked, you know, have you looked at how some of the drug barons live? I mean, yeah. I, mean be, I told it raised eyebrows when uh, Forbes listed, listed a number of the drug billionaires among, among the uh, wealthiest people in the world for the first time a few years ago. Well, in your model, it doesn't pay to be a criminal. Pay but the other point is, you know, there's almost nobody. I mean, you know, I don't think you'd even 
find absolutely universal agreement that Mother Teresa wasn't wasn't a criminal. I mean, it's almost you know, some people a country doctor, most people think that person's okay. You know, um, a hit person, most people think that person isn't okay. And in between, there's everybody else. And you know, some people like that job, and other people don't like that job. Mm. So, kind of playing off that. Um, how will the internet be different in you know the next fifty or a hundred years? In, in what you just described, it, it almost sounds like uh, I kind of think of things as well. You know, the problems that we have are going to get better, but well, you know, kind of what you're saying is that crime is an essential component of it, and it will always be there. It, you know, is there some kind of dial that's going to happen where there's going to be a lot of crime, and then you know maybe it'll go down? And what, in your opinion, is going to happen with that over the next? I don't know. I mean, I think you know. My vision of a hundred years from now um, is no better than it ought to be. Although I did write a paper about cryptography a thousand years from now, mm -hmm. I was firmly sure I wouldn't be around to answer for the mistakes. <laughs> um, actually, I think if I live a hundred years, I'll probably live a thousand. But uh, the uh, you know, I think I kind of think that the second half of the century will be. I mean, look what. Mm -hmm. I don't know, the problem that dominates life now, maybe that's slightly exaggeration, but the interrelationship, maybe confrontation between people and machines is a, is a vast and growing aspect of society. One, economically, loosely, the, as in the machines are taking our jobs, an automated teller machine, an automated gas pump, those really function like an employee or a gas jockey more than they function the way a lathe helps a machinist make something. At another level, the explosion of machines to control people, all of these detailed access control and monitoring systems uh, for every, you know, every, every environment. So I think that basically it, it, isn't, it doesn't look at all the way the science fiction writers saw it, with the single exception of that wonderful story of logic named Joe, which foresaw the workstation you know, taking over from the tele telephone. In 1946, um, but by and large, I think the uh, robots versus people fight was not seen very clearly. But I think, in fact, that is going to dominate near human history, and that the distinction between people and machines uh, will decline dramatically. I don't know if it'll go away, but I think you know we all going to be cyborgs maybe in 20 years, certainly in 50. And, you know, I thought, I, 40 years ago, I, I said I thought there would be designed human beings by the end of the 21st century. It now looks to me like we're headed, we're focusing in on the end of the first quarter. So, you know, how will is the it gonna, be different? Is it going to be anything like it was in The Matrix or probably well, not know, that? Sorry, I haven't read The Matrix. I'm illiterate. <laughs> um, probably not that stylized and cool. But. Uh, no, I just haven't read The Matrix. Uh, I... Uh, I can uh, brag that Arthur C. Clarke told me to read Cryptonomicon, but I haven't read that yet either, though I did buy a copy on the basis of his recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I don't know, so I don't know what it said in The Matrix, but... Um, I was referring to the movie Keanu Reeves. Oh, yeah, I didn't see the movie either. So. Yeah. Uh, it's, exa <laughs> it's, uh, it's all about... And I was waiting for a more advanced one. It was going to be called The Tensor, right? I thought this was... <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's move up a little in dimensions in our mathematics. <laughs> well, it's all about um, people versus machines, pretty much exactly okay. as you described. Well, and as I say, I don't think it's, I, I don't know whether that they had it right or not, but um, the, you know, so if you ask about the internet in particular, well, will we still be calling it the internet? I don't know the answer to that. I think almost certainly whatever it is will, by a hundred years from now, have confronted the sort of interplanetary aspect of it that Vince Cerf and some people have been, I've forgotten what they call it, solar net or something like that. Mm -hmm. But communications really do become different when you're looking at hours of delay and you need so forth. Uh, will we still do it? packetized. You know, my imagination doesn't run to something better, uh, but that uh, my imagination didn't particularly run to packets 50 years ago, so right, right. I don't know the answer to that. Um, will we humph? 
I don't know. You know, will we will we think of it? I mean, one of the things the internet is doing is blurring distinctions between communication and computation. So right now we're sort of in the infancy of presenting ourselves over the communications medium, having that as a major enhancement of what we are, and that's you know that's kind of Star Wars holodeck like. But I don't see why there shouldn't be a huge amount of that. Uh, and in one respect, you might have growing autonomy in the way that there's people who live major online lives and present a persona. The more computers you have working to implement your, your persona, you know, the more scales you can have on your dragon. Or less clothing you could have on your avatar. Right, exactly. Uh, oh, but you know, actually, clothing, that was a wonderful thing. In Second Life, I saw two people dancing together, and, and the, the woman's skirt just, the guy is inside the woman's skirt. It just flows around him. Not because that represents some, you know, aesthetic or political or anything statement. It's just it's easier to compute. <laughs> I love nice. it. So I've got five, now the five most difficult questions I have for you. Are you ready to play five questions here on Paul.com? as we close out our interview. And what, is, what does it mean to play? Uh, well, you'll find out right now. So, I say there's five questions. I take the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have to wait or bring the fifth over here? It's downstairs. Not easy to get. So, <laughs> three, que- three words to describe yourself. Uh, I'll abbreviate it to take the fifth. How's that? Okay. Okay. If oh, you, I'm going to listen to all five questions before I then decide, then decide which ones I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, this sounds like something harkens back to Lincoln, who wanted to duel with sacks of shit at five paces. Uh, <laughs> Jack, you were there, right? <laughs> I mean, I would think if I were going to kill a cereal, I would the right thing, you know, I eat it with a fork, personally. Excellent. Nice. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? You can't just you have, believe you, you just ask no, you, have, you have no <laughs> shame, do you, Paul? I don't know nope. the popular game. <laughs> So hypothetically, last, would you, uh, last question, you up to uh, what's four? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll come back to ask Grabby Grabby. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? A life lived in fantasy. Stranded on a desert island, which tablet would you bring with you if you could choose only one: an Android, an iPad, or a Surface? Uh, well, I don't own any of them, so I have no way of making a decision. Okay. Well, you said before you didn't run uh, Windows, so what is your operating system of choice? No, I'm, run, you know, I'm running a Mac. Okay. okay. But not for any very deep reason. Uh, my wife is an early adopter, and she was using them a decade ago, or you know, longer than that, but a decade ago. Uh, uh, laptops sort of, you know became became reasonable and it runs unix and i knew how unix worked and i had never used any of the windows stuff mm. i hadn't used microsoft since dos and so i uh, i adopted these and uh, they seem okay uh and you know unless they offend me too much with their pride in technology to turn off your camera when the police don't want to be photographed I'm, i'll probably continue using them <laughs> very nice very nice well, Whit Divi, thank you very much for appearing on Paul.com. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Take care. You thank too. You. Uh, with Bye-bye. that, we're going to take a short break. We're going to get set up uh, for Allison's uh, technical segment. Everything so. is broken. Please help me. Okay, we'll oh, do no. that. <laughs>